Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, welcome everyone this afternoon to our webinar at ICPSR. Today we are talking about archiving data with ADEP, which is our Disability and Rehabilitation Medicine Data Archive, a new project at ICPSR. Um, and really, this presentation is, do is designed to give information about how to, uh, about why you might want to share data, how to share the data, and um, and actual nuts and bolts of how to do it with ICPSR and, and then what comes next. Oops. Okay, there we go. Um, so Linda mentioned, um, please um, write down questions into the text box. I welcome them and would love to clarify anything that I'm not clear on during the presentation. And, um, and I will answer them at the end in part just because I'm not so good at reading questions and talking at the same time. So uh, submit your questions and, and I'll be happy to get to them. Um, so I mentioned that this is a webinar for uh, ADEP, and ADEP is uh, the Archive of Data on Disability to Enable Policy and Research at ICPSR. It's been around for just, a, just over a year. Um, it's recently had funding from NICHD and other NIH institutes to um, grow its collection, specifically in the area of rehabilitation medicine and disability data. Um, so that's really what we're doing this webinar today, to begin to introduce to the community of researchers in rehabilitation medicine and related fields um, what data sharing is all about. Um, we have a beautiful website. We welcome all of you who are on the webinar to visit our website to find out more information uh, that I don't cover uh, in the webinar and, again, ask questions. Um, so just to put a, a face to the name that's speaking at you this afternoon, um, I'm Amy Pienta and I direct this project. Allison Stroud is the manager for this project and she and Jai Holt, the data curator on this project, gave a webinar just a couple of weeks ago, so maybe some of you heard that. Um, this one will not replicate too much of the introduction that they gave to the project, uh, but rather be focused on data archiving and, and how to do that. Um, so this is the roadmap of the really big uh, questions that I'll talk about this afternoon. So um, first I'll talk about why researchers don't share data, and I am not immune to this. I am a researcher, and I don't always share my data either. Um, and so I'll talk about that in part because there's a lot of solutions that we can offer to that dilemma um, and also um, ways that we can help you. Um, but not sharing data does cause problems, and as extra motivation, I'll spend a little bit of time um, discussing a little bit of a case study on what happens when data are not shared. And, um, and then turning to talk a little bit about uh, the increased sort of federal pressure from sponsors that researchers are under to share their data and where that is coming from and what it really means. So what does really the, the federal mandate about data sharing mean and how do you comply with that mandate? Um, and then, of course, because we have um, this funded project here at ICPSR for, for the fields of rehabilitation medicine and related fields, um, we have a lot of assistance and help and resources for researchers that are just for the first time maybe thinking of sharing their data um, or sharing their data from um, the fields that we are targeting. And so, um, so I'll talk about that help. Um, and then the actual how-to of how to do it, and, um, and then after you deposit, did it really make a difference? So this is our roadmap for the afternoon. Um, buckle in and, and uh, join me on this ride. So why researchers don't share data. So I mentioned that um, I, uh, myself, uh, collect data from time to time and find that it's difficult to share data. At ICPSR, I'm also the Acquisitions Director for the Broad Organization, and so I am talking to researchers on a weekly basis about depositing their data into ICPSR. And so, um, because I've done that for a number of years, I think I've heard a lot of the very big reasons of why it's difficult for researchers to think about sharing their data. Um, and then finally, we've done research on this here at ICPSR. We've asked people what are the top reasons they don't share data, and this is the slide that you're looking at. These are the top reasons, the most frequent reasons that researchers, uh, in the social and behavioral sciences at least, um, and I think it applies to many other disciplines, um, what they say about why it's difficult to share their data or why they don't want to share their data. Um, the number one reason is that uh, the data have some kind of confidentiality risks, and we do have ways to manage that at a repository like, um, like ADAP. And, uh, and so I'll get to that in a, in a little bit. But 
protecting the confidentiality of the study participants. Many researchers are also very concerned about um, getting scooped or somebody publishing something from their data that they themselves wanted to publish. Um, and we know that there's a lot of time uh, that people put into collecting the data and they want to make sure that they're able to maximize the investment on their their investment by putting giving a return on, on what they had hoped to get out of it. Um, but at the same time, um, uh, there's often um, parts of the data that the researchers won't get to. Um, there's of course needs for replication, those kinds of things that motivate people to share despite being concerned about um, not wanting to share. One of the most frequent things I hear as the acquisition director is I'd love to give you my data but can I approve all the users before they use the data? Um, and that's not um, sort of in the spirit of the equality of access that uh, a repository provides, but I do get that question and again we'll have some um, ways to make sure that the original researcher is getting credit and other things um, so that um, sharing becomes easier and addresses at least part of this challenge. Um, it's also very concerning that oftentimes people aren't ready to share their data because it's messy, because there's errors in the data, or perhaps they don't have time or resources to clean it up. So those last two reasons are, are the, other, the other big ones that we hear um, often. And so what's ended up happening, um, at least historically, is that data are very rarely placed in a repository. And there's certainly a case to be made that all, not all data um, uh, belongs in a repository. Perhaps it's very small. Perhaps a journal article is the, um, it contains an appendix with the data set itself fully in it. And so um, putting data into the repository isn't the gold standard, but it certainly is an expectation that has been increasing. And so if you look at this little chart of um, National Science Foundation and NIH scientists who collected data, um, many of them have not archived it. Most of them um, retain copies of the data, of the data uh, but when asking a swath of researchers who've collected data in the past, what we found is that um, even a quarter of them can no longer access the data. Um, and so we learned a lot about talking to scientists over the years in a variety of research projects and surveys. Um, and one of the things that boggles my mind is the, um, the types of data that people are collecting. And this is going to reflect sort of an older selection of data, things that probably aren't as common uh, today because this was a study of historically people who collected data. But these are data formats. Uh, that people have, uh, that, that social and behavioral scientists have collected. And you can just look at this list and anticipate that a, rep a repository, even um, a big repository like ICPSR, is going to have challenges in taking some of these formats in. SPSS files, Excel files, SAS files, ASCII, Word, those things aren't so problematic for ICPSR. We deal with those every day. But when you get to the, to the much um, smaller uh, instances, um, if we don't normalize that collection to a format that we can understand today, it might not ever be recoverable. Um, uh, some of the other parts of the research we've done with researchers who are wrapping their head around sharing their data um, uh, included some qualitative interviews with uh, those researchers about why they, why they haven't shared their data in the past. Um, some of the big things that come up again, no funding for archiving. Sometimes the federal government will fund a data collection. It's much harder to go back and get money for the archiving piece. Um, a lot of researchers in, um, anticipate that there's not very much significance in what they collected. Um, also, um, researchers were often talking about um, data uh, being uh, lost or, or destroyed or, or thrown out uh, in interviews that we did with them. Um, and those are all interesting problems. So what happens though? So if, if you're a researcher who's collected data um, and the data haven't been shared, um, what, what's next? Um, over the years um, that I've been here, there are many data sets that come, you know, pretty close to the end of a study. You know, the, when the study's done, um, we have a pretty easy time ingesting those data and bringing it into the repository because it's in a format that, that's still readable. Um, but not a trivial amount of data sets come to us like what you're seeing in the picture and, and that's um, in a format that, that we just no longer process uh, or handle on a routine or everyday basis. Um, and so this was a large punch card 
collection that came to us many, many years ago. And ICPSR simply didn't have the resources to process it, so it held on to it, hoping that one day we'd find the resources um, to do that. And eventually, after years of sitting there, um, we did find the resources to recover this old punch card collection. Um, but, but it's just striking uh, the expense of that data re recovery effort. Um, so this old punch card collection, once we began to find funding to uh, recover it, um, spanned a time period of about three years of work. Um, intermittent work, surely, um, but applying for different pilot grants, showing that the, the recovery was going to be feasible, getting um, the NIH to actually fund the actual recovery. Um, it involved a lot of people over the years, curators, um, archivists, uh, scientists themselves, um, interviews with the original team that collected the data, etc. So a lot of people went into uh, the recovery of that work. Um, and as I mentioned, we had to seek external funding. And when all's done and said, the actual money that we spent was over $100,000. Um, and I can say certainly a lot of goodwill from staff and, and time spent uh, raising that money as well. Um, so a large, a really big survey today, um, just by comparison, um, you know, one or two people are going to work on it. It's um, once staff get to it in their queue, it's going to take just two to four weeks to uh, work on, um, to normalize and to bring into the repository. Um, and in cases like what I'm talking to you about today, oftentimes we have funding to do that. Um, and, and then we don't have to seek <laughs> outside funding to do that work. And so. Um, the expense of data recovery um, is drastically different as time marches on after the data collection is done and it just gets more expensive. Um, so that said, I want to turn to this question of um, uh, knowing that it's difficult to share, knowing that it's even more difficult for a repository when the data aren't shared, um, certainly what we're seeing is that there's increasing um, pressure from uh, federal agencies and from the scientific disciplines themselves. Um, for scientists to share and archive their data. Um, it's not entirely new, of course. Um, and so as back as far as 2003, NIH was requiring um, researchers to share their data. Um, and so for large um, NIH grant applications, uh, you had to have a plan for sharing your data or state at least why the sharing wasn't possible. And so that's something that began at least um, uh, over 10 years ago to really shift how scientists were thinking about this. But that said, um, because it only applied to grants where um, over $500,000 would be spent in a single year of the grant, um, it meant that a lot of projects and a lot of data collections um, didn't fall purview to this requirement. Um, another interesting thing is that even though there was a data sharing uh, statement that researchers would be asked to provide in their large grant applications, um, it wasn't part of the peer review process, and so there was very little scrutiny about whether it was a good plan or not a good plan. It was sort of left to program staff to interpret, I would say. Um, and then um, certainly um, there were many ways, I think, that researchers interpreted the requirement and um, doing things like putting the data on a website, um, uh, responding to requests for the data. Those were ways that people thought that they were uh, meeting the sharing requirement. The National Science Foundation, um, as recently as 2011, really shifted their emphasis on, um, on data management plans and data sharing. And so because they wanted data sharing to be uh, an important part of um, their um, grantees' work going forward, they issued a statement that all their projects would be required to include data management plans. Um, for how the data would be managed and certainly how they would be shared as part of uh, the course of the research. Um, it was just a very short two-page plan. It's still in existence today. Um, the nice thing about this um, requirement at the National Science Foundation is that it is peer-reviewed and, and managed and monitored uh, very closely. Um, and then the, the last sort of policy development that I'll mention has been um, uh, during the Obama administration, um, the OSTP memo, the OSTP stands for the Office of Science and Technology. They issued a memo requiring all federal agencies that give grants um, to uh, require 
that the, the publications resulting from the grants and the data resulting from the grants would be shared. Um, so large agencies, certainly NIH and NSF and many, many others are um, in the process of putting together uh, their plan of how they will meet uh, this OSTP um, directed requirement on making sure that all of the research um, is publicly accessible. Um, but really, I still think that doesn't really tell us what that really means, but I think over the last three years um, since the OSTP memo came out, it's begun to unfold how serious um, federal agencies would take that mandate, what they'd be required to show to be in compliance with the mandate, um, and in turn how that trickles down to the researchers um, is beginning now to become evident. Um, and so uh, the old model of um, a researcher making sure that their data were stored and backed up um, on a hard drive perhaps, perhaps on a removable hard drive, perhaps on a network hard drive, um, was becoming uh, not at all what people meant by sharing their data. Sharing it upon request isn't public access. So instead, um, what has emerged to show compliance and what most of the uh, agencies who are writing about how they will be um, in compliance with the OSTP memo are focused on uh, the FAIR uh, standards for sharing data. And FAIR standards, it's an acronym F-A-I-R, uh, stands for the data being ensuring uh, to be publicly accessible. It means that the data are findable, that they are truly accessible, um, that they are interoperable and reusable. Um, so simple storage and simple responses to requests to share data isn't obviously going to be in compliance. Um, but what is fortunate is that um, there are many resources going, uh, coming from the federal government uh, to places to help researchers meet this requirement, understand it, put it into their workflow of how they do their research, um, and ADAP is an outgrowth of, of that. Um, and so NIH has um, uh, given us money so that we can help the research community, and so that's the exciting thing that I'm here to talk about next. Um, and so, um, so that a researcher doesn't have to do all the work, repositories, at least the ADEP repository, has the approach that we will do um, and ensure that a lot of the work is done to make sure that the data do meet those FAIR principles. Um, so we do the disclosure review on files that we get. We do things like standardizing the missing data, ensuring that the data are of good quality, that there's not outliers or wild codes in the data. Um, that uh, there are variable labels and value labels and quantitative data sets. Um, we'll produce a code book for the researcher, um, as well as uh, quality checks and releasing the data in many different, at least quantitative data sets in many different formats. Um, and what that means then is that we're meeting the FAIR standards, but also that the data are preserved, not just for use today, because you can go back to the researcher and ask them what a variable meant, but preserved for 10 years and 20 years and so on um, when um, the data are going to need to stand alone without other people supporting the data, that, that our user can come to the data not just today but in the future and be able to access them. Um, so a lot of the things that um, uh, researchers um, uh, are still concerned about despite the fact that there are models for sharing data and repositories that will take them are things that we can help and handle because of the resources that we have at ICPS and ICPSR and certainly because of the the project funding that we have from NIH uh, to expand data sets in the rehabilitation and disability areas. Um, so some of the things that are very common um, are concerns that the data themselves are sensitive or identifiable. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned, we will do disclosure work and redact data so that the data can be made available as public use data when possible. Um, another uh, option that we have um, through ADEP is that um, the data can also, indirect identifiers can remain in the data file and then we can make them available using data use agreements um, where users apply for a data, apply for data use and get a data use agreement if they have a security plan for the data, a valid use of the data, an IRB approval to um, analyze the data. 
um, the data are then downloadable to them. We also have a virtual data enclave um, for data that stay here that people connect into, again, with a data use agreement. Um, so in those instances, the data don't have to be nearly as uh, de-identified because the use of the data is monitored and restricted. Um, and then uh, another um, common concern is that sometimes the data are still in use. Maybe a, a dissertation from a student is forthcoming, um, and, uh, and we do allow for embargoes on the data so that the data can come to us, that we would do all of our steps to clean and curate the data, as I mentioned above, um, but the data would be um, uh, embargoed for an agreed-upon period of time until they were were released. So delayed dissemination is also um, something that we can help with. Um, so these are actually data that are uh, one of my data sets that are being uh, cleaned right now and managed and curated at ICPSR under a different project. Um, but but it's true. Data themselves are often just just giving them to I, giving them to the ADEP archive can be a challenge because the documentation isn't clean. I'm you know looking down this this list that I um, snapped of my data, and I can't remember why um, some of the things are missing and some of them are not missing. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that activity variable is on the end there, um, and uh, and certainly. Uh, passing it over without fixing those things is is difficult um, difficult to think about. Um, we do have help for uh, uh, researchers who are beginning the process of getting their data ready for archiving. Um, on our website, on the ADEP website, you will find a link to um, the gu a guide to social science data preparation that will cover things like what data should I give to the archive. Um, how should the data be uh, labeled? What's the documentation that the archive would expect? Um, so all of these things are in a handy guide that you can either click through online or download the PDF and print for, for your use or um, for a data manager's use, et cetera. Um, the other thing that uh, we have through ADEP is us. Um, so we provide technical assistance um, through emails, through phone calls, um, possibly at meetings when we were at conferences that uh, you might be at as a researcher, um, meetings to talk about um, getting the data ready, um, trying to understand how much the researcher really has to do versus how much we're able to do at the archives so that it, it is as um, uh, easy as possible for a researcher to um, get the data to the repository. So the technical assistance piece is big. Um, also, uh, the, uh, the overarching center, uh, the C CLDR, the Center for Large Data Research and Data Sharing and Rehabilitation, um, is the home for uh, uh, the project. And, uh, and they have a pilot uh, a pilot project uh, funding, pilot project funding, so that researchers can apply for funding to help them um, have some money to spend to get data ready. And so often people are applying for money, um, getting a graduate assistant or a data manager or themselves to have a little bit of time covered to do the work of deciding which files to send, making sure the documentation matches up basically. Um, those few steps that need to be done before getting them to the archive. So pilot funding um, is available uh, that you can apply for. Um, and then in addition, um, uh, training so that we can help as many po people as possible uh, get their data ready for archiving. Um, webinars like the one you're hearing today and the one that uh, Allison and Jai gave two weeks ago, uh, data management workshops, sometimes at conferences. Certainly we have a summer training program here at ICPSR where we bring people to learn some of these tasks. Um, so attending, um, attending webinars and, and uh, workshops that we have um, are another way that we are here to help. So here's the actual nuts and bolts of depositing data at ICPSR. Um, off our website, you will see um, a deposit link, and when you click on that, you come to this entire deposit form. There's then a link that you can begin the deposit process. Um, the deposit process doesn't take very long. I'll give you a few tips and tricks of how to be ready to do it or how to ask someone on your team to be ready to do it. 
Um, but there's basically two pages that are, there are two steps to the process. The second one optional. So this one here is the, 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 required, um, the required step. Uh, so this is what you get to when you click on that link. I'm ready to deposit my data. Deposit now. Um, and this is the information. So the name of the depositor, so obviously that one's um, uh, low-hanging fruit, uh, a title of the data collection, and as descriptive a title as possible, but one that hopefully references how the data have been talked about in publications um, is really helpful to supply to us. Um, a list of the principal investigator and all the co-PIs or collaborators that will become part of the citation for these data. Um, an abstract that describes the study, easy to, um, to add. Um, and then uploading the actual data and documentation files. And I'll get to in a couple of minutes um, what some of those things might be. But thinking through the data, so a data file and a codebook, assuming that you have that, um, uploading those two things. There is a two gigabyte limit on our upload. It's just too slow if you have something bigger. Um, and then there's some more information that you can, that you'll get if it is bigger than that, um, so that you can uh, get the data to us on some kind of physical media through the mail. Um, and then there's also a few notices that we ask you to tell us about, um, asking us if this is an update to a collection that you've already given us in the past. Um, so information if that is true, and if it's not, then um, that's an easy no. <laughs> Um, whether the data, you consider them to be confidential. We will do our review in either case, but, um, but if, it's, if you think the data includes some indirect identifiers, it's a good thing to check yes and then tell us why, or if it's a sensitive topic, um, tell us what the sensitive information is. Um, and then a place for other comments about things that you just want us to know about. So it's really not very many fields, just a little bit of information, and then signing the deposit agreement. Um, so keep in mind that the the depositor can be um, uh, the PI herself or himself, but it might be somebody else. If it's somebody else, you probably don't want to sign the agreement. You want the PI to sign the agreement that they allow for the repository to take a copy of the data to do its work and to disseminate and to distribute. Um, and so you either um, complete the e-signature, it's just an electronic signature, or, you, or the person would supply an email address for the person who would be asked to sign the form and then submit. So that's it. That's most of the things um, you don't even have to look up. You can just complete this without um, additional reference information. So making sure the files are ready usually means that you can get us the data um, over the course of just a few minutes. There is a second page of information that is optional but appreciated on behalf of the ADEPT repository. Um, and these are things that help us describe the data. If you don't supply the information to us, we do our best to um, go out to the literature that um, we can find where you've published about the data or to a website that might describe the project. And we try to fill out this information um, as best we can. But if you um, can supply the information, that would be, that's, that's the most ideal situation. Um, and it's just basically, I counted 17 questions, many of them check boxes um, for you to fill out. So things like who the funding agency and grant number uh, is that you would want referenced, and, um, and that's really helpful. Uh, the methodology of the study, things like the, what the universe is, the unit of analysis, what the sampling frame is, uh, what the response rate is, the time period for when the data was collected, et cetera. Um, and again, information about the geography uh, uh, that we would use then to describe the data for users looking to find the data, because a lot of users are looking for a particular geography. Um, and then finally, keywords. So those are the kinds of things that you're asked about. Most of them are um, information that a researcher or someone on the team would have at the top of their head. Some you might have to look at. You can always take a look at this form and um, uh, jot down things that you need to know before you start. So these are the actual things that we're looking for in the upload. So going back to that page one, I just wanted to make sure that I, that I talked about this. Um, so one is, of course, the data. Um, if you've already submitted the data and you're just coming back to give us documentation, um, 
you don't obviously have to upload the data again, but if you are um, uploading for the first time and uh, submitting to us, um, you're going to want to give us the data file, hopefully. Um, quantitative data files uh, tend to be things like SPSS, SAS, STATA, R, um, all of those formats are um, really easy for us to work with. So if you can give it to us in one of those, that's the best. Uh, qualitative data files, um, any kind of ASCII text format or rich text format are appreciated. Um, we also accept video files, um, MPEGs or JPEGs, um, the ones listed there are um, doable. Audio files, uh, two formats listed that are preferred form formats or examples of formats that we most readily work with. Um, and there are other possibilities, of course, you can always contact us uh, to see if the format of the data that you've collected is something that we can uh, work with and accept. And then in terms of documentation, um, of course, you know, it's all optional, um, but helpful if you have it. If you have a code book, um, it's uh, a good thing to supply to us or at least the data collection instruments so that we can create the code book. Um, any kind of IRB approval is helpful so that we know that um, we're um, managing uh, the data dissemination in the way that is consistent with how, how the IRB was written or the informed consent statement. If you've written an informed consent statement that doesn't seem very friendly to sharing, it's not um, a given that the data cannot be shared. Uh, we have had many researchers in that position who go back to their IRB and um, describe to them a plan to work with um, ADAP or with ICPSR to uh, distribute their data and, uh, and those plans have been approved in, in many, many instances. Um, so anyway, that's a situation though if you think that there's a problem with your informed consent or your IRB approval for sharing, um, please contact us and we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, for qualitative data files, it's um, good to have some kind of a roster, an Excel sheet or something that um, references um, the characteristics of the people in the study um, so that people can select the qualitative um, interviews that they might be interested in, for example. Um, the bibliography, things that you've published already, really important. And so there is a field where you can enter that on the metadata form that I showed you or on the form that I showed you on the prior screens. Um, but if it's a simple uh, list, a publication list that you're keeping, you can just simply upload the file to you and skip that other question. Um, so anyway, these are the things to have ready to upload. Um, and I want to have time to get to this last little bit, which is, um, of course, uh, once we're able to do our work, the curation work that I talked about, the disclosure review and the, the quality checking and the documentation enhancements, um, after deposit, um, did putting your data at a place like ICPSR or ADEP make a difference? Um, and so because we do such um, a, a careful job of curation and cleaning of the data, we think that it means that the data are sort of best prepared to have as broad an impact as possible. It means that a user, when they download the data, is going to have a pretty easy time understanding what each of the data elements means and be able to use them um, carefully and uh, to their maximum value. Um, and because of that, uh, it's possible then for the data to have its true, its true impact. Um, we also, um, in the information that we collected on the first step of the data deposit form, ensure that we have all the pieces that we use to promote that the data are cited correctly by the users who download and use the data or get approval to use the restricted data and work with the data. They, every user would get um, the citation to cite in the articles that they publish, in the books that they publish, in the presentations that they give, um, that they are encouraged to use. And this is how we can track the use of the data um, and also ensure that the team who collected the data gets credit. Um, another way that we have um, found is important is to track how often the data are downloaded um, to ensure that um, researchers who might be going back to a funder asking for a follow-up round of data collection um, 
this information is always available to any depositor who's given us data. You can contact us and we will prepare a really nice report of the impact of the data, how many times people look at the data, how many times they download the data and the code books, um, and uh, other information um, that we track and keep. Um, and then finally, we're also always tracking um, how the data are being used in the published literature. It's a hard thing to do. We certainly ask users to um, come back to us and tell us how data are used, and some do. Um, but also, we go out to the literature and look for instances where data sets in the archive have been cited. And, um, and so that allows us to keep a current bibliography of all the papers that have been published related to a data set. As you do more things with the data in subsequent work, you can come back and tell us about them, um, but hopefully also we're finding them at the same time. And so in addition to just showing how many users are um, looking at and downloading data and code books, um, we keep this list of, of publications. Um, and I can tell you that we've done some research looking at researchers who put their data in repositories versus those who don't. And there's a really big difference. There's many more publications that are associated with data sets that are shared. Um, and it's not a perfect causal model, but, um, but it's certain that, uh, that a lot of the high quality data sets that are shared through repositories um, do get do get considerable and important use, and so I think that's something um, to keep in mind. So my last slide here before I look over to questions. So if you've been thinking of um, asking a question and haven't, go ahead and type it in real quick because I'm about to look. Um, but before I do that, um, I just want to acknowledge our uh, our partners um, in this project. So I mentioned the Center for Large Data Research and Data Sharing and Re Rehabilitation. Um, that's the um, umbrella um, organization. Uh, the partners in that are uh, UT, University of Texas Medical Branch, uh, ICPSR, of course, um, the um, in, uh, Industrial Labor Re Relations School at Cornell University, and Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation here at the University of Michigan. So all these groups together um, are looking for ways to um, expand use of data sets. Um, throughout the rehabilitation uh, research community and, and one of those ways is through the repository project that we have going here um, at ICPSR called ADEPT. So um, thanks to the partners for working with us to, uh, to make sure that this resource is being best used uh, by the researchers in the various fields. Um, so I'm going to look over to questions. I'm not seeing any, but let's see. But that was perfect. That was 40 minutes, exactly what I had planned. Um, I'll hold just for another minute. Oh, I see a question now. Great. Let's see. How do I see it fully? Hang on. Linda, I'm not sure if you're there, but I can't read the entire question. Um, it says, can you give me some more exam concrete examples of what can be? And I cannot. The last word of what can be deposited. Are you unable to um, expand the question box? Yeah, I know. I have, I'm in full expansion, but it's just hidden, and I can't. Huh. Yeah. Okay. If you click on it, maybe. Ah, there, there we go. OK, that works? sorry about that. Yep. All right, there you go. Okay, can you give me more information about concrete examples of what can be deposited? I'm not exactly sure the intention of that question, um, but um, original data collections are the primary thing that we are looking for. Um, we have a huge range of um, biomedical data, social data, economic data, political data here at ICPSR. Biomedical data is our probably fastest and increasing um, part of the, the data sets that we offer through the repository here, in part because of projects like ADAP. Um, so randomized clinical trials um, are certainly possible. Um, large um, databases that are um, measuring uh, and following um, patients over time. Um, 
claims data comes to us, administrative data, survey data. Um, I, you know, there's very few things that um, wouldn't be something uh, that you could give to us. Um, so hopefully that helps answer the question. Any other questions? Okay, for instance, would audio files from interviews be okay? Ah, thank you. Yeah, so absolutely, audio files. Um, we certainly have um, audio collections here at ICPSR. Um, audio usually poses quite a few confidentiality risks, so it tends to not be downloadable public use data sets, but rather data sets that we would manage with one of those restricted options that we talk about that I talked about. So with a data use agreement, a user could then get access to the audio files and um, and analyze them in their home environment ideally. So that was would be how we would most often handle audio files. Okay, so when I think of data, I think of numbers. So I'm curious about whether or not qualitative data is acceptable, like interviews or user experience studies or notes. Absolutely. Um, we have a large number of qualitative data collections at ICPSR. We also have a lot of mixed collections that are um, part quantitative, some kind of structured, structured survey plus um, interviews for more a closer, more in-depth look. Um, so different kinds of mixed method studies are also popular um, to give to us. Uh, we have um, uh, also video collections, just to think outside the box. We have um, classroom data, for example. We have sensor data, so data that are dumped from uh, sensors. We have a brain image collection that we are um, bringing in um, to ICPSR to ADEPT, I'm sorry, currently. Um, and see any conference presentations, any conference presentations planned in the near future? Um, so we do go to um, many uh, professional meetings to promote uh, the project. Um, I, I don't have any that I know that we will be at for certain, um, but we would welcome suggestions from the community about um, professional meetings that would be useful to have our project be at because you're at them uh, so that we can serve, um, uh, serve the researchers there. Thanks for that question, James. You stumped me. <laughs> okay, any last questions? I think I've gotten to all of them. Fantastic. Well, if there are no other questions, um, I think that I will close for now. Um, I'll remind you here um, to uh, email us if you have any questions. The webinar recording will become available and you'll receive a link so that you can um, come back and um, listen to it again if there's something you missed or if you'd like to share it with others, we encourage that as well. Um, thank you all for attending this afternoon. Have a great day.